Let me pray for us and we'll get right into our study. Father, I thank you again for this chance to come and to open up your word and allow you to speak to us. Lord, I thank you for the thing, things that you've shown me in my study and the preparation. I pray also, Father, thanking you for the, what you're going to show us tonight and what you're going to show me. I love how, as I'm being used of you to teach what you've already shown me in my study, other things come to my mind and you have me share them. or Other things just come to my mind and you encourage me with them for me. Lord, I thank you that as I talk to not just the folks that are in this room, but all those that are listening online, either live with us or going to be tuning in later, I thank you that you know what's happening in each of their lives and what has happened, what's going to happen. And as I just yield to you, you through your spirit are able to speak to different people's situations and speak directly to them in a way that they know you talk to them about things I don't even know about and I don't have to. And I thank you for that. And Lord, Lord, I rest in your power again tonight for what you want to accomplish. Thank you for this wonderful gift you've given us to spend time with you and your word. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 47. While he was still speaking, this is Jesus. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd of swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a, as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus, that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power, of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, He deserves death. Then they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Now, like I said at the beginning, we won't have time to finish all of this tonight. There's way too much here. But in order to kind of get where we need to go tonight, I need to remind you of where we left off last week. Jesus has been praying in the garden, asking the Father if there's any other way that mankind's sin can be covered and forgiven. You remember, he was in the garden with his disciples, went a little further with Peter, James, and John, and he prayed three times the same manner. Lord, if there's any way to have this cup be removed, may it be so. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Now, I want to re read you again what I have in my notes. Jesus is praying in the garden, asking the Father if there is any other way that mankind's sin can be covered and forgiven. So Jesus is asking the Father, is there any other way? What was the Father's answer? No. Well, hang on for a second. I thought our world was full of people saying there's lots of ways. There's lots of ways to God. But Jesus himself prayed Father, is there any other way? And the Father's answer was, no. This is the only way. Folks, if you're out there listening right now, you're online or you're even here, and you still are falling prey to that lie that's out there of the enemy, that you may believe in Jesus and that's the way you get to God, but there's many ways to God. Folks, think about what Jesus went through. 
If he went through all that he went through and the beating and the suffering and the crucifixion and on top of that, the separation from the Father, and that was just one of many ways to God, that's horrible. But Jesus himself prayed to the Father if there's any other way, and the answer was, there's no other way. That's why Jesus himself in John 14, 6 says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Folks, that's not, that's not popular in the world's idea today. You've got to understand, there's so many people out there that think that there's got to be lots of ways. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Jill. Where does it say no? The answer, is, the answer of no, that's a great question. The answer is the fact that he goes forward to the cross. You see what I'm saying? If there was another way, the Father would have told him and he would have taken it. But the fact that he gets up and says, let's go to the cross, that's the obvious answer that the answer is no. And if you also know the whole story of what Jesus is doing in the Scriptures, he's already said, the reason I came is to go to the cross. And he said he's the only way, and the only way is through him. Go to Acts chapter 4. Now, hopefully a lot of you know this, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. But again, we are going to be living, let me just say this to you now, as the days get closer to the return of Jesus Christ, we're going to be living in a time in which truth is going to be less and less believed, less and less preached. The scripture says that people are going to look for people that are going to tickle their ears. People are going to turn away from the truth. And that's why in the days that I have left on this earth, I want to be used of God to preach and to teach to you the truth of the word of God no matter what happens. I'm not going to be a jerk about it. The gospel is offensive all by itself. I'm not going to be proud of the fact that I'm a jerk about it. I'm just going to share with you lovingly and clearly and plainly the truth. Listen to Acts chapter 4, verse 12. The scripture says this, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That means Buddha, Muhammad, I don't care who it is, all your different ways, there's no other way. There's no other way. Go to Hebrews chapter 9, though. Go to Hebrews 9, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he, Jesus, is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Did you catch that? Not only is he the only way, not is that the only way, not is he the only name under heaven by which must, men must be saved. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So I just, we didn't finish that last week, and I wanted to make sure you understood that because we, we moved on into the next section. Now Jesus, by the way, has prayed this question last week. We saw him ask, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any way to remove this cup, please do so. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Did Jesus know the answer to the question that he was asking? Yes. Of course he did. Again, like I've already touched on, he already knew that he had come to go to the cross. The scripture tells us that in John chapter 12 and many other places. And that's why he came. But him asking the question is valuable for us. Jesus is praying in the garden three times. Father, if there's any way, could you let this pass from me? Is very valuable for us because it also shows us his humanity. 
Because He's God, He already knew and He's fully obedient to the Father, but He's also 100% man at this time, and He, and He still is, by the way, he's still, he's still, even though He's glorified, have you ever thought about the fact that after Jesus died and rose from the dead, He still had scars? He still had the hole in His side and the scars and the holes in His hands? I mean, you and I, when we get our new bodies, praise the Lord, they're not going to be like this one. We're getting new bodies that are glorified bodies, and Jesus got a glorified body. But how come His glorified body still had scars? How come His glorified body, He was able to eat and it didn't hit the ground? Because He's always going to be man. Go ahead. You were saying something, Warren? He had not ascended yet. He had not ascended yet, but even after that, the Bible says that we're going to be able to see Him who's been pierced. Remember, John was in heaven and he saw one that looked like a lamb who had been slain. He's going to have a human form all along, forever and ever, because he's eternally, there's, even though there's one God, there's always been three persons of the Trinity, even though it's just one God. They're all the same, and they're all the same essence, but yet they all have different roles. And folks, Jesus had to come, take on human form, and experience everything that we've experienced, and that's valuable for us to hear. I want to tell you a couple other things. Go to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, look at verses 9 through 18. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 19, But we see him, this is Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect or complete through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise, and again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Now, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For it's surely not its angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, listen closely, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Do you realize when you're struggling with temptation, you can actually pray to God and he understands? The Bible says God's not tempted. Yet Jesus, who is God, because he was also human, experienced temptation. It's valuable for us to see him in the garden wrestling with the human side of him, saying, look, I already know this is why I've come. I know the answer to the question, but i got to be honest with you, my flesh doesn't want to do it. That's why he said to his disciples that night, pray, watch, pray. The spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. Go to Luke 22. Look at verses 39 through 46. Luke 22, starting in verse 39. And he came out and he went, and as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly as his sweat, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Let me ask you a question. Was Jesus faking it when he, struggled, when he, put, when he was praying in the garden and, and looking like he was struggling? If you know anything about medical things, there's a real medical condition that if you suffer and you're in agony enough, you will actually start to bleed from your forehead. It's a high, high level of stress to get to that point. But Jesus was in such agony and such distress as a human, he literally was sweating and then the sweat turned to drops of blood and it really happened. Folks, you don't have a God who doesn't understand. 
You don't have a God who doesn't know what you're going through. He's experienced suffering and sorrow in ways that you would never understand. But also he understands things. Everything you go through, he's experienced it. The Bible says he knows the struggle and he wants to help. We know 1 Corinthians 10, 13, how there is no temptation which has seized you, but such is common to man. And with it, he won't allow you to be tempted with more than you're able to bear. And with the temptation, he'll provide a way for you to escape. Have you ever thought about the fact that one of the great reasons for temptation to be allowed in our lives is so that we would get closer to God? See, a lot of times we think it's our chance to show how strong we are to God. No, once I started to realize I'm not strong enough to defeat this temptation, I need to go to Him. Actually, the temptation has come so that I would get closer to Him. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and the devil will flee. He doesn't flee from you. He flees from the one you just backed up into His robe. Go to Matthew 26 and look again at verse 41. Matthew 26, verse 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I want you, maybe if you haven't grasped this yet, I want you to understand this. If you're a believer in Christ, God himself lives within you. Jesus himself lives within you. The spirit of God is within you. And he's within you, ready, willing, chomping at the bit to empower you, to give you everything you need for life and godliness. It says that in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And we have these wonderful promises that if we take hold of them, we can escape this corruption that's in the world because of evil desire. It's there. He's there. He's ready. He's willing. But he's waiting for us to say, I need you. But if you try to defeat the enemy, if you try to handle temptation in the flesh, in your own strength, you'll lose. That's why we need to pray without ceasing. That's why we need to be constantly in prayer. Don't pray all of a sudden once you have that situation arise. Oh, there's nothing wrong with praying when the situation arises. But if you pray when the situation arises, you're in trouble. I've had over the years as I have... Uh, gone around the country and preach in churches, and this usually happens where the, someone from the church will come and say, Pastor, um, the service will be starting in just a few minutes. Do you need to go and get in the pastor's office and get ready? Do you want to go get alone and pray? And I always tell them the same thing. If I'm not ready now, you're in trouble. If I'm not ready now, I'm in trouble. You ever noticed that when Jesus cast the demon out of that young boy, you remember, they came down from the mountain, and some of the disciples had been trying to cast the demon out of the boy, but they were unable. And Jesus comes and tells the demon, because the crowd's arising, he says to the demon, come out! And he does. Then later, the disciples come and they say, how come we couldn't cast it out? And he said, because of your lack of faith. And he also said, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. By the way, has anybody gone back and read that story? Jesus didn't pray. He didn't stand there and say, oh, Father, here is my prayer. He told the demon, come out. But I thought that came out, only came out with prayer. Why? Jesus lived a life of continual prayer, a life of constant communication with the Father. And folks, I hope you're hearing me. The Bible says to pray at all times in the Spirit. Pray without ceasing. You need to learn how to breathe in and breathe out your relationship with God. Just like you need oxygen on a breathe in and a breathe out process, every one of us, that's the abiding relationship. And if you, on daily basis... Learn how to rest in Him, walk with Him, talk with Him as you're going about your life, doing your things. You will begin to understand that abiding relationship and you'll start to see God do things in your life and through you that you would have never thought you were ever able to do. And He'll give you peace and joy along the way. But too many of us use the Holy Spirit like a spare tire. When the trouble comes, we sure hope there's air in it. You ever thought about that? Oh no, it's had a flat. I sure hope there's a spare tire and hope it's got air. Oh God, this is what I'm going through. I hope you're there. Watch and pray. Folks, the spirit within you is willing, ready, able, chomping at the bit to help. Your flesh is weak. Don't rely on that. Now, back to our passage for tonight. Judas comes. Look again at verse 47. Now, while he was still speaking, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, Judas came. Don't miss this. One of the twelve. That's important. Judas comes when with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I kiss is the man sees him. And, the, and he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. 
and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Now, before we go any further, I want to just pull a couple of things out about this. Jesus is being betrayed by Judas, and Judas is helping the religious leaders capture Jesus in the dark, was an even worse betrayal than if someone else had done it. Does anybody else want to know, anybody have an idea why? Why was it a worse betrayal that Judas had done it when it, compared to somebody else? The answer is right there in verse 47. Because he was one of the twelve. He not only was one of the many disciples, there were lots of disciples, but he was one of the twelve that Jesus had designated to be apostles. Go to Psalm 41. I'm, all of us have probably been done wrong by somebody in our life. But those of us who might have been done wrong by somebody close, maybe a husband or a wife, a child, there's a different level when it's someone that close. Look at Psalm 41, verse 9. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Jump over to Psalm 55. Now, we don't know specifically who David's referring to here. We know in Psalm 41, 9, it's a prophecy about Judas. But David is writing about a struggle that he's going through. But we don't know fully. There's some Bible scholars have some guesses as to who he may be referring to, a couple of names, but we don't need to get into that now. But in Psalm 55, start, look at verse 12. For it's not a... And standing behind him, Jesus, at his feet, weeping, this woman began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Jump down to verses um, 44 and 45. Then turning toward the woman, he says to Simon, Did you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. So the scripture says she came and she kissed his feet. But now Jesus tells us it wasn't just a kiss. It was a continual kiss. By the way, in the Greek, it's the same way it's translated that Judas came and kissed Jesus. In front of all these people, he doesn't come and say, that's the guy. He comes up and very showingly, oh, I love you, kissed him over and over. Let me give you another example. Go to Luke 15. You'll see another example of this type of kiss. In Luke 15, verse 20. And he arose off his father, saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. It's the story of the prodigal son when, when he comes back to the father. And by the way, this kiss of the father to the son is not a, it's a hug, it's an embrace, it's a, mm, 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 mm. I love you. Go to Acts chapter 20. Verses 36 through 38. In Acts chapter 20, verse 36, Paul's meeting with the, the elders from Ephesus, and he's told them he'd never see him again. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and there was much weeping on the part of all, and they embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all of the word that he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. Here it is, the same Greek word translated kissed. It's a continual hug and a long by the way, you say, well, well, maybe Judas meant it. Who has taken over Judas's body at this point? Satan. Satan has come to indwell him. Remember this? So when Judas comes, he's not just designated who it is with a kiss. He's mocking Jesus. And he calls him what? Rabbi, teacher, master. He comes in front of these people and he says, Rabbi, teacher, master, mwah, 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 mwah. as phony as you can be. His words were as soft as butter, but war was in his heart. What is Jesus' response? Knowing that this is phony that this is for a show, that this is to mock him, to make a fool out of him. What is Jesus' response? He calls him friend. Folks, let me just tell you, we've got we to stop for a second here. 
Our natural fleshly reaction when people do us wrong is to defend ourselves, defend our honor. Especially, by the way, some of you husbands and wives out there, some of your biggest fights have probably been with your spouse. Why? Because they're the most intimate with you, and it hurts the most if they hurt you. But unfortunately, when we're hurt, our first reaction is to hurt back. But Jesus, who is God, yielding himself continually to the Father, never acting out of the flesh, always acting out of the power of the Spirit, calmly looks at him and calls him friend. Says, just do what you're going to do. I really know what's going on here. Why is Jesus so calm? Here's why. He knows that ultimately one day, judgment will come to Judas. And he's leaving it to who? To the Father. How many of us over the years have thought, something must be done. They're being phony. We can't let them get away with this. Well, you've got a small God if you think you have to defend him. By the way, that's what Peter tries to do in our story. Go back to Matthew 26. Jesus said to him, verse 50, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. You don't think I can't appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But then how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? Hang on for a second. Peter, in his mind, well-meaning, acts out of the flesh to defend Jesus. And Jesus says to him, hang on, do you realize that you're acting like I can't handle this without your help? That's foolish. Secondly, let me just say this to you, Peter. All who try to defend and take care of themselves, they're on their own and they're going to perish in that way. Jesus showed love and compassion to Judas even when the natural fleshly reaction would be to strike back. I think it will help us to do the same to others if we're reminded of something in our past. When Jesus died for you, we weren't even born at that time. But after we were born, were we born Christians? I sure hope you say no. I've asked too many people, hey, when did you become a Christian? Oh, I've been a Christian my whole life. That's not possible. The Bible actually says that there needs to be a point where you've passed from death to life. There's no one righteous, not even one. We're all guilty in the eyes of God. We're all sinners. You're not born a Christian. You might have been going to church from childhood because you have parents that raised you in the church. That doesn't mean you're a Christian. There needs to be a point where you pass from death to life. But Jesus died for you before you were born, before you knew him. And even after you were born and he was there revealing himself, many of you out there ignored him, mocked him. But he died for you before any of that. Why? Well, go with me to Romans chapter. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Look at verses 6 through 10. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Now for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Did you catch that? In other words, if God so loved the world who hates him that he sent his only son, if God's attitude toward those who reject him and are his enemies and are against him is to die for them and to send his own son to die for them, his attitude toward those who reject him is love. Let me ask you a question. The next verses go on and say that those of us who have received this forgiveness through faith in Jesus Christ, we should understand that if God loved us when we were his enemy, how much more now will we be spared from his wrath now that we're his children? Let me ask you a question. Does God love us Christians more than he loves the lost world? Good. No, he doesn't. The advantage we have is that we get to experience the full extent of his love 
because of being his children. But don't think for a second that he loves you more. He loves them just as much. And even those in hell, he loves. He loves. Go to Romans chapter 12. Look at verses 14 through 21. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Now, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That doesn't mean everybody's going to be at peace with you because you don't have control over their response. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Hang on for a second. How often do we avenge ourselves? Once a month? Never avenge yourselves. You live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. By the way, we see at the end of our passage, which we won't get to tonight to break it down in Matthew 26, we see that the Pharisees who are mocking him and the religious leaders are slapping him and they're saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you? By the way, did he know? He knew every bit of their DNA. Could he have said, it was you and you and you, and told them a whole lot about their lives and then gotten them right then? Yep. But then how would the scripture be fulfilled? How would the plan of the Father come to full fruition? Let me say something to you that I need you to hear me. We're going to be going down this road a lot in the days to come, in the weeks to come, in the years to come, if Jesus tarries. Are we not living in a time when... It appears, and Scripture backs it up, that those who are going to be in power are going to be anti-God and evil. And your natural tendency and reaction of the flesh is to take up arms and to do something about it. Well, how will the Scripture be fulfilled if you do that? Because if I read my Bible... The Bible actually says that those who walk with the Lord and trust in the Lord keep their eyes on Him and He'll give them victory and joy and peace in the midst of the struggle. And God's had me been meditating this past week on a section of Genesis 18. Over and over, I've been praying over this passage. If you know anything about Genesis 18, Genesis 18 is when the three visitors come to Abraham when he's at the tent. And two of the, angels, the visitors are angels and one of them is Jesus Himself before He took on flesh. And they come and they say, your wife Sarah is going to have a baby this time next year. Of course, she's inside the tent and she's laughing. And then, she, of course, she says, I didn't laugh. But then the two visitors, the two angels, start making their way to Sodom and Gomorrah, where Lot and his family, which are relatives to Abraham, live. And God, as he's making his way to Sodom, he's walking with Abraham and he says, shall I hide from my friend what I'm about to do? So God then tells Abraham about the judgment that's coming on Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham makes a very powerful statement. He says, I know you, God. It's not like you to wipe away the righteous with the wicked. That's not who you are. That's not how you do things. You wouldn't wipe away the righteous with the wicked. As you bring judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, if there's 50 people righteous there, would you spare the city? And listen to what God says. If there are 50 people there that are righteous, I won't do it. Listen to who God is. He doesn't judge everybody all at the same time and wipe away the righteous with the wicked. He actually takes the righteous away before the final judgment comes. And the final judgment is coming. Of course, Abraham goes back and forth with him down to 10. Because in his mind, he thinks, okay, of course, there weren't even 10 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. But there was Lot and his family who were deemed righteous by God. Don't miss this. What does God do before He drinks the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah? He gets the righteous out. You say, Jim, wait a minute. Noah and his family, when God brought judgment on the earth in the flood, they weren't taken out of it. They had to go through it. No, 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 no. They were taken out of it. Listen to me. They were brought above the whole judgment. Were they not? 
in the ark, which is Christ. They were elevated above it while it all went on below them. And when they came back, it was a whole new earth starting over. They were taken away from it before the judgment came. And the Bible says this, folks, that He has not destined us for wrath. We looked for Jesus and His return. So between now and then, things are going to get bumpy. Things are going to get trialsome, if you will. But we shouldn't be trying to right the wrongs. We shouldn't be trying to get things taken care of. And there's going to be a lot of Christians out there that disagree with me. And there's going to be a lot of Christians that think we need to do this. But if I read my Bible, the Bible said this is the way the world's going to end up at the end. I don't see Christians taking arms and turning things around. But those of us who are righteous will keep our eyes on Him. And we'll look to Him. We still should vote. We still should be a part of praying for our leadership and praying for God to move and to spare us and to give us, to give us a break. But listen, you can't just quote Second Chronicles 7.14 and say, if my people will call by my name, will seek my face and pray, then I'll hear from heaven. Everybody loves to quote that. But they don't ever go and look at Ezekiel chapter 14 where God says that if He's chosen to bring a judgment on a land, even if Je- Noah, Job, and Daniel were in that city, it ain't stopping it. They'll be spared because of their righteousness, but the judgment's still going to come. So you got to understand, I don't know if this is the final judgment time, but Scripture sure seems to look like it is. Between now and then, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. You keep your eyes on Jesus, and you walk with Him, and you allow Him to fill you as you walk in that continual process of prayer and supplication and bring your request to Him, and He gives you the peace that passes understanding. And folks, we have an opportunity in these dark days to let people see Jesus in a way they've never seen Him before. I want to have people starting to ask you to give reason for the hope that lies within you. Listen closely. The rest of that verse says, but do it with gentleness and respect. I don't see Christians taking up arms in the scriptures in the last days. We're looking to Jesus. Jesus himself stood before Pilate and Pilate looked at him and said, don't you realize I have the authority to have you put to death or to have you released? Why don't you say something? I'm in control over you. And Jesus calmly stood before him and said, you'd have no authority over me unless it were given to you by my father. You may think I'm looking at you, Pilate, but I'm looking through you to him. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do. Pray for those who are in leadership. Pray for them that God would give them mercy like he's given you mercy. And keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Look at verses 20 through 23. Sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 23. 1 Peter 2, 20 through 23. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Listen closely. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Why does Jesus calmly say to Judas when he's mocking him in front of all those people, Rabbi, why does he call him friend? Because he's leaving Judas to the Father. It's not many hours later that Judas comes to his horrible, horrible end. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Look at verses 43 through 45. Matthew 5, 43 through 45. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? 
Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We, like Jesus, can be patient with our enemies, because we too know that God will judge everyone fairly in the end, and we too were his enemies once, and he gave us mercy and grace. Let me give you one more scripture along that line to have you kind of meditate on. If you want to write it down, you can turn there with me if you want. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, look at verses 1 through 5. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 5. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. The moment we start looking at the lost world and feel like we're better than them and they're horrible people is the moment we've lost sight of the fact that so too were we. But God in his mercy saved us. You realize that most of your New Testament was written by a terrorist? You ever thought about that? What was Paul, we know him originally as Saul, what was he doing to the church? Persecuting. He was getting letters and permission to go and to arrest them and have them put to death. He even when he shares his testimony later on in Acts, he says, I stood there approving of Stephen's murder. But God showed me mercy. Folks, some of these people we look at on the other side of the aisle that we think are evil still can be saved. And they may turn into some of the strongest Christians that the Lord has in the last days. We don't know. All who live by the sword will die by the sword. All who try to defend themselves, all who try to take things on their own, in their own power, and their own strength in the flesh, God says, you want to go that way, go ahead, but you're not going to miss out on all that I got for you. And I just want to encourage you tonight. It never hit me until I was doing the study for this how Judas had mocked him publicly like he did. And Jesus calmly just said, just do what you're going to do. Now, Matthew has Jesus being arrested and taken straight to Caiaphas' house. But that's not actually what happened. Because John gives us a fuller account. They're going to end up at Caiaphas' house because Caiaphas is the high priest. But go with me to John chapter 18, and you'll see that they actually made a little detour on the way to the high priest's house. John chapter 18. Look at verses 1 through 11. Now when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a brand of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I'm he. By the way, in the Greek, it just simply says, I am. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I'm he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So John's account tells us that it was Peter who actually swung the sword. Now look at verse 12. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas. For he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. And then he's in interviewed, if you will, and interrogated by the former high priest, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, a man named Annas. And then look at verse 19. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples. In other words, they then bring him to the high priest. All right? So here's what I want you to understand. Matthew's not wrong in saying they, they brought him, then they bring him to Caiaphas. They did. 
But he doesn't tell the whole story. By the way, don't get mad that he doesn't tell the whole story. The book of John says at the very end of it, if everything that Jesus did was written down, you wouldn't have enough books to fill them, to, care, to, to write it all down. So Matthew's doing a concise thing. We've been seeing that all through our study of Matthew. So he just jumps to the trial. But I want you to see something. Actually, you know, I've got to go over one more thing a little bit long. We've got 10 minutes. We've got time. Then we'll come back to this one thing. We'll close with that one thing. I've just already talked about the fact that Jesus warns Peter that all who want to defend themselves will perish because of it. Go with me to James chapter 1. I've been touching on this over the last couple of weeks. How our first reaction typically is probably wrong. Have you ever noticed people's first reaction in the Bible was usually wrong? Lord, we saw some guys out there preaching and they weren't one of us. We told them to stop. What did Jesus say? Leave them alone. They're fine. Lord, do you want us to call fire down on them? Relax, guys. Lord, tell my sister to help me. Actually, she's chosen what's best. Lord, I don't know about the rest of these bums, but I'll never deny you. Actually, for the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you're going to act like you don't know me three times. You ever notice that? I want to just remind you of this. Your first reaction in anger and whatever it is, you might call it righteous anger, possibly, most likely, is wrong. James chapter 1, look at verses 19. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear and slow to speak. Slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I'm learning. I'm a lot like Peter. My wife will tell you that. My kids will tell you that. I'm one of the ones, first ones with an answer. And I'm pretty sure I'm right. And I found out over the years that most of the time I wasn't. And I've always respected those men in the churches that I was pastor. Those, those men who didn't say much at business meeting. But when they finally spoke, everybody got quiet because you knew you were about to hear some godly wisdom. Because they had been sitting there slow to speak and prayerfully listening to the Father. And when they spoke, their words were under the control of the Holy Spirit. Their speech was seasoned with salt. And they spoke wisdom. I want to be one of those kind of guys. I want, to, I want to move from first guy to speak, probably wrong, to the one who prayerfully thinks about it and prays it over. And then God gives me the wisdom to share the truth. Go to Psalm 37. Some of us might need to take some time to really meditate on this psalm. It's too long. I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. I'm just going to read verses 1 through 11 to you. Psalm 37, verse 1. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in His way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while... The wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Folks, Judas at this moment looks like one of the greatest guys to the world, to the religious leaders and all those people. He's got 30 pieces of silver in his pocket. He's leading all the religious leaders. He's leading a band with armed, with swords and torches. He's the one who's in charge. He's the one that comes up to Jesus and mocks him. And Jesus calmly says, do what you're going to do. Listen closely. Did Jesus know what was going to happen to Judas in the next hours? Jesus knew even though it looks like you're winning right now, Satan is in control of you, Judas. 
And the moment he's done with you, he's going to kill you. You may look at these other people on the other side of the aisle from you politically. You may see all these people that are taking power in America or on the globe and all this stuff that's going on and all these people that are planning evil and the one world government. The Bible says there's going to be a one world government, folks. And we ain't stopping it. You may see all this and think, but they're winning. We can't let them win. The scripture says in just a little while, the wicked will be no more. We need to wait for that day. When all the scriptures fulfilled, and we who are his, who have put our faith in him, who look silly to the world, look like we're doing nothing, are going to be elevated in glory and proven to be right. We're going to wait. We're going to wait. Oh, there's going to be lots of Christians that are going to come alongside of you in these days and say, no, no, the church should rise. The church should rise. Oh, we're going to rise one day when Jesus comes and gets us. Until then, we're to wait patiently. The scripture, I could spend the rest of tonight, next week, next week, it, Probably going to do it anyway because the Lord leading me that way. I can show you the scriptures are full of this, folks. In just a little while, wait patiently. Wait patiently. We've been given an example by Jesus. Jesus was looking at Judas and thinking, you probably think you're the king of the hill right now, but you don't realize Satan's going to kill you within a few hours when he's done with you. The Bible actually says in Psalm 73, the psalmist Asaph said, my feet had almost slipped. I almost thought about quitting when I saw the wicked and how they're fat and happy and everything they want they get. And I thought, what's the point of serving God? What's the point of worshiping Him? Well, I, I, I wash my hands in, 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 in innocence every day. It's a waste of time. And then he says later on in that Psalm 73, he says, until I discerned their end, how quickly they're swept away like phantoms. Folks, do you realize every one of us is either one breath away from heaven or one breath away from hell? Keep your eyes on the Lord. All right, let's go back to Matthew and look at that one last thing that I want to pull out from tonight's passage. Look at verse 57. Look at Matthew 26, verse 57. Then those who had seized Jesus led him, he's already been to Annas' house, now he's led to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. Hang on for a second. It's in the middle of the night. It's probably about two in the morning. They don't have somebody go knock on all their doors and go get them. Jesus is arrested in the garden and they take him to Caiaphas' house, palace, by the way, the scripture says over and over. And they're all sitting there, already there. It's interesting, we see, and we'll come back to this next week, as they go through their mock trial. The high priest tears his robe. We'll get to that next week, but he, the high priest was never supposed to tear their robe. He tears his robe. He says, he's uttered blasphemy. What is your verdict, guys? What do you think? I mean, we've just heard this. What do you think we ought to do? And they said, oh, you know, after hearing all the facts, our decision now is that he probably should die. Go to me, with me to John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verses 45 through 53. John chapter 11, verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, this is after his raising Lazarus from the dead, had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests of the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. Nor do you understand that it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Now, he didn't say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not only for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. They'd already made up their mind. They'd already had their decision made. The trial is a farce. Well, something should be done. This is, they've already got it all planned. And we know they've already got it all planned. Uh, they, they, they've, they've, 
they've cheated. They, they've, they've had all their plans and, and we can't let them win. Well, how will Scripture be fulfilled? It says it's going to be like that in the last days. If it's going to be stopped now, who's going to stop it? God. If it's not going to be stopped, He's already determined the tipping point. And we are to wait patiently and love them until then. Because they still have some breath left. And they too, like Paul, might still be saved. Don't think you're better. Don't say, okay, well, I'm just going to pray that their judgment's harsh. No, no, no. Leave that to the Lord. Well, don't you think they should get what they deserve? Let me ask you a question as we close. Do you want what you deserve? Nope. Yeah. Isn't that interesting in this day and age in which we live? It's interesting in this day and age in which we live where everybody's all of a sudden pulling up all the stuff that people have done in the past. And you can't serve in office because what you did when you were a teenager or what you did when you were in college. Have you ever noticed that everybody's all of a sudden righteously, hey, they did this or wore blackface or did these things. They're not fit to serve. And it's very interesting and ironic to me that the world is wanting everything to be brought to light. Except the light. But Jesus says everything will be brought to light. This thing that they're wanting is to be done to everybody else is going to happen to them one day too. Thank the Lord. Yes. You and I have had those things removed from us as far as the East is from the West. He will not hold our sins against us nor remember them forever. And pray that they get that same mercy as well. I love you all. We'll see you next week. Thanks for coming.